So uh, I'm delighted to be here, and uh, it's great to lecture in a building that still uh, smells like new. <laughs> and also, it's great to lecture in a university whose name rhymes with my name. <laughs> I don't get. <laughs> I don't get to do that very often. Uh, all right, so. It's, uh, this talk, as you can see from, from the title, is rather ambitious in, uh, in scope, but it's going to be also necessarily incomplete because in one hour uh, we cannot really uh, hope to, to cover a lot of what information theory is nowadays. Now, this is a, um, a theory that is undergoing a renaissance. Uh, there is a lot more interest in information theory today than uh, there was only a few years ago. So what I'm attempting to do here in this talk is explore why uh, there is this renaissance of interest in information theory, show you some of the open problems in the field, and kind of look at the gradient of where I see the field going, what kind of problems are receiving more interest and what kind of problems are receiving less interest than in the past. So, information theory is a theory of a certain age already, very certain age, 699 months uh, yesterday. Uh, 1948, Claude Shannon wrote this paper, A Mathematical Theory of Communication, which was a revolution in, uh, in uh, communications, computer science. So, what has happened since then? Well, I don't want to give a historical talk in terms of what has happened since then. I want to focus primarily on, on the present. But I will indeed show you, um, I will indeed talk about some of the success stories that information theory has had as far as applying the theory to the design of systems. So this is primarily the impact of information theory in the practical world. So as, as you probably know, information theory is a theory of fundamental limits. It tells you what the dividing line between what is possible and what is impossible. But in addition to that, it also acts as a design driver. It also tells you, gives you intuition as to how to approach these limits. Now that may be not so easy, that may be quite hard to do in some cases, and it may, rely, it, may, it may necessitate technology, VLSI technology, computing technology, that is quite sophisticated. So, um, of course, nowadays, part of the renaissance of information theory has to do with the fact that we now have computing systems that have enough horsepower that we can indeed achieve those limits. So let me give you a few examples of success stories. We have this, um, no, let's see. We have the sparse graph codes. So Shannon in 1948 uh, had to come up with the performance of the best possible codes for data transmission through noisy channels. And at that point, nobody had invented even a, a single code, maybe with the possible exception of the Hamming code. So what Shannon did was analyze random codes. You would pick a code at random, and then he would analyze the expected probability of error of that code. And then he showed that by picking uh, codes at random, you could get a very good performance. Now, the problem is that when you pick codes at random, they don't have a structure. You cannot encode them and decode them, decode them with reasonable complexity. Okay? They are very hard to describe. So these sparse graph codes uh, are a great compromise between having enough randomness that, appro that they approach the good performance predicted by Shannon, and yet they have enough structure that they can be encoded and decoded uh, with linear time. Com linear complexity in the block length. All right, so you may have heard about turbo codes, uh, low density parity check codes, and so on. These are pr codes that are already in commercial technology, cellular phones, third generation, and so on. Universal data compression, this is uh, another big success story of information theory. Uh, you fall fam you're fa all familiar with this, uh, GZIP, for example, uh, and every uh, 
operating system contains a uh, universal data compression. When you send uh, bits through a modem, first thing the modem does is compress them, uh, remove the redundancy, and then add redundancy to combat the channel noise. So this is um, these universal data compressors again have the uh, feature of being linear time with uh, uh, with the data and achieve Shannon's fundamental limits and we call them universal because we don't need to know the statistics of the source we don't ha need to have any assumptions about what the source is they learn this statistical structure from the data itself. Voice band modems, again, a technology that is one of the um, pioneering contributions to, uh, uh, to finding, to, to actually achieving a rate close to the capacity of the channel. Discrete multitone modulation, this is the technology behind DSL, for example. And there, information theory gives you some very interesting lessons as to how to allocate the power in different frequencies. So the algorithm they use in, in uh, DSL to allocate the spectral shaping of these frequencies comes directly from Shannon's original work. CDMA, Code Division Multiple Access, this is a technology that started uh, at the time of World War II, and Shannon was one of its main proponents. And then it uh, revolutionized the uh, cellular uh, telephony um, industry, uh, some of the second generation phones use CDMA, uh, third generation phones use CDMA, and so on. Multi-user detection um, is a technology that uh, eliminates or mitigates the interference um, caused by mutually interfering digital streams of information. Like for example in CDMA, signals transmit simultaneously in time and frequency and uh, multi-user detection deals with uh, removal of this um, of this uh, interference, and this is really uh, very much uh, motivated by the fact that information theory tells you that by exploiting the structure of this interference, there is much to be gained in terms of the uh, achievable uh, limits of the channel. Multi-antenna, uh, you can use. Um, you can use antennas, uh, multi-antennas at receiver and transmit, kind of like, in, in essence, to create bandwidth. So you can, by having several antennas, you have then signals that travel through many different paths, and in that way you create bandwidth. Uh, so you create, uh, you, you actually multiply the capacity. So again, the, um, the interest in this field has very much been driven by uh, the ultimate limits that people have been able to predict for these multi-antenna channels. Space-time codes, again, exploit not only the traditional time domain that error-correcting codes exploit, but also the space domain afforded by multiple antennas. Opportunistic signaling, this is something that is already implemented in third generation uh, telephony. When the transmitters know the channel, then they can allocate uh, more energy in favorable channels, in favorable frequencies, or to favorable uh, users that are uh, that see a, a good channel. Discrete denoising. Um, this is a relatively new uh, application of information theory. Analog denoising has been around for, of course, many decades. Kalman filters, Wiener filters, uh, wavelet uh, denoising, and so on. But in the discrete domain, think, for example, English that has been corrupted by uh, typos, for example. Well, you could do some denoising based on a grammar, uh, like, for example, word does. Um, but suppose that you don't know anything before. Um, you have uh, just a text, and you want to uh, remove some of the errors from that text without knowing anything about that language. Can it be done? Well, of course, Shannon originally said, well, if you have a channel that introduces errors, what you need to do is add redundancy to your message so that then that redundancy will help you eliminate those errors. But here we haven't added any redundancy to the message, and yet we can correct many of the errors. How? Well, because the language itself already has some redundancy. So we can exploit the redundancy in the language in an image or in an English text in order to remove many of the errors. So if we have time, we'll, I'll show you some 
actual experiments later. Cryptography is another, um, another success story. Shannon had, um, uh, before he actually published this 1948 paper in Mathematical Theory of Communication, he had dealt with cryptography. And he proved the fundamental theory of, uh, theorem of cryptography, which says that if you want ironclad uh, uh, privacy, you need to have a key that is as long as the plain text. If you want pretty good privacy, then um, traditionally people have relied on NP being not equal to P, uh, having, uh, having, um, uh, having uh, uh, the, the decoder, the, the, the eavesdropper, have to solve a polynomial, uh, uh, an exponentially complex uh, system. Now, more modernly, there have been people who have said, no, I don't, we don't want to rely on NP being equal to P. What we want to do is to have algorithms that are good in the information theoretic sense, in the sense that the information transferred from the plain text to the eavesdropper is very small. Okay, so then there's been quite a bit of interest in this area. It's also been a lot of interest in uh, data hiding and um, watermarking and so on from an information theoretic uh, point of view. Okay, so now let me show you some of the open problems in information theory. First, I will start with the problem of data transmission. Then we'll go to data compression, both in the lossless and in the lossy versions. Okay, the reliability function. Um, here we have Claude Shannon in a picture uh, taken, I guess, sometime in the 1960s. And uh, this shows uh, a graph of this function for this channel, the binary symmetric channel. You put a 0 or a 1, and it, ge it gets received correctly with probability 1 minus delta. So this is really kind of like the simplest channel you can think of. And here you see uh, a function where uh, the x-axis is the rate at which you transmit, and the uh, y-axis is the the rate at which the error probability goes down to zero as a function of the block length. So the lower the rate, the faster you can make your error probability go to zero. If, you, if your rate is at the capacity here, then, uh, then the error probability can be made uh, vanishing, but not exponentially vanishing. So we have, we have that the curve actually meets capacity there. So as you can see, there is a shaded region here. And the shaded region is because we know upper and lower bounds. But even for this very simple channel, we don't know this function. So there's been a lot of work on this, as you can imagine, uh, especially from the MIT School of Information Theory. But still, we are at the very beginning in the sense that we don't know it even for a channel like this. Zero error capacity. Um, Shannon, uh, in 48, was able to find the capacity of channels by allowing a certain error probability, an error probability that goes to zero with block length, as I was saying. But what if you insist that you want a zero error, absolutely zero? Well, in that case, the problem becomes, um, in a way, not very interesting from the practical viewpoint, because from the practical viewpoint, the channels that we are interested in always have a non-zero probability of impersonating a code word by another code word. So there is uh, really nothing you can uh, do uh, with that. But you can pose the problem uh, in a theoretical, kind of like in academic interest type of thing. So here's a problem where the input to the channel, in this case, is you choose an edge of this graph. And the output is going to be one of the vertices. So if I choose this edge, you're either going to get, the receiver is going to get either A or L, all right, with some probability. It doesn't matter what the probability is. OK, so then, as you can imagine, I could, for example, choose to signal by pressing this edge, this edge, or this edge. Then I will never have any doubt as to what is the uh, transmitted sequence. All right, can we do better? Well, even for this very simple graph, I don't know the answer. Nobody knows what is the zero capacity of this graph. 
Now, Shannon, uh, um, for, the, for the Pentagon, when we have only five rather than seven edges, he, uh, uh, he had uh, an achievable rate, which was that you could achieve log five every two symbols. And, um, but he couldn't prove that that was the best. And that was only proved at the end of the 70s, that that, that was the actual zero order capacity of that channel. So that, that's it. We know it for, uh, for the Pentagon and graphs that have an even number of edges, but that's it. So that's, that's, a, that's a purely combinatorial problem. And, uh, and that seems to be quite, quite challenging, as you can imagine. Now, another problem here is that the results in information theory are asymptotic, asymptotic nature, what happens when block length gets very large. But increasingly, in applications, we're interested in relatively small block lengths of, say, the order of 100 or 1,000. So then we ask the question, what is the trade-off between this block length and the reliability with which we can recover the information? So this is an area of growth. It's not a specific open problem, but it's kind of like a, a research agenda to really probe further into this problem. Now, feedback is an area that started with Shannon 40 years ago, or at least the capacity of channels with feedback. You can imagine that in the 1950s, there was a lot of interest in uh, in feedback, that was the golden age of uh, control theory and so on. So people started thinking um, already at that point, what would happen if you would have feedback in your, in your communication loop? And that is actually something that is indeed available very frequently because you have two-way communications in most cases. So Shannon actually was able to prove a very interesting result, which was that if the channel has no memory, then feedback doesn't help you. Even if you know everything, the, the transmitter knows everything that the encoder knows, you cannot increase the capacity. So even if you have this kind of brutal feedback, there is, it's useless. Well, is it really useless? Well, two caveats. One is that it's useless if the channel has no memory. But if the channel has memory, you can indeed use it to your advantage. And second, the second caveat is that it's useless as far as the asymptotic behavior is concerned. But if you're really concerned about this delay error probability trade-off, say you're operating in a region of small block length, then indeed feedback potentially can help you. So the challenges here are how to actually harness this feedback when it's not this very ideal Shannon feedback that you see everything that the uh, decoder sees, but maybe you only see a few bits of information. So uh, coming up with constructive schemes, when the channel has memory, we really know very little about the, the Shannon capacity. So say, for example, you have a Gaussian channel with a given transfer function, and we have this kind of Shannon feedback that you know everything that the decoder sees. We don't know how, what is the uh, channel capacity in that case. So we're still very, very um, at the infancy of understanding this. And nowadays, there's been a renaissance in, uh, in this problem. A lot of people working on feedback. Deletions, uh, you know, we can set up a problem for which we don't know the capacity in just one line. Say I send a block of zeros and ones, and with a certain probability, every bit gets deleted from, from the message. But you don't know. The receiver does not know which bits have been deleted. Okay, otherwise, that's called an erasure channel, and that is well known what the capacity is. So if, you, if, if these bits get deleted with probability delta, then the capacity is just a function of delta, and we have no clue what that function is. Okay, there are only some bounds that are probably very loose. So uh, as soon as we get away from the usual paradigm of knowing always that we have synchronism and we know which bits corresponding to which time, then the problems become very tough. When we have deletions, when we have transpositions, when we have loss of synchronization, those are interesting problems from, from the engineering viewpoint, but theory uh, doesn't help much. Okay, multi-user channels. That's been a very important area 
in communications. As you can imagine, in the wireless communications, that's a very important case. But even in other settings, uh, it's, it's important. For example, suppose that you have um, copper wires. So um, you have a bundle of copper wires. And these copper wires actually uh, have crosstalk with each other. So you're sending, uh, you're sending your, uh, your transmission, and your neighbor is using the same bundle. So there's going to be crosstalk between the, the two transmissions. So say you have a situation like this, where you have a, a pair of encoders and decoders, and there is some noise that affects the communication, but there is also some cross-coupling between these streams. We don't know what the capacity of this channel is. Okay. Simple channel like that with just one parameter. We don't know what the capacity is. Two-way channels, that's kind of like the same thing. But, uh, but now, these two channels, these two streams are actually using uh, like the same channel, but in opposite directions. So this is one possibility. This is just a fancy way of saying, of writing that y is the end of x1 and x2. All right, so both receivers see the same thing. They see the end of the 0 or 1 that, you s that each transmitter s sends. We still don't know what is the best rate that we can achieve in this channel. Broadcast channels, uh, this is a situation where you have um, one encoder uh, that sends one message, but this message is heard by several receivers. And this encoder actually has different information for each user. So um, even a channel like this, where you have probability of error if you send 1, say, but if you send 0, you always get 0. Even for a simple channel like that, we don't know what the capacity of this channel is. So you know it if it's a binary symmetric channel. If you have two binary symmetric channels of different uh, probabilities of error, then we indeed know what the broadcast channel capacity is. So there have been some uh, interesting advances lately, but we're still far away from knowing, uh, from having a, a general approach to general broadcast channels. Relay channels, that's another case where we are in the dark. Here we have an encoder, but now we also have a station that um, can boost the transmission, is able to do decoding of this message and also re-encoding of the message. So it can help uh, the direct path between the encoder and the decoder. Something as easy as this, we still don't know what the capacity is. So here, the problem is that in information theory, we know how to demodulate when the rate is below capacity. But in this case, the relay may actually be receiving information which is transmitted at a rate higher than capacity. And in that case, we don't know how to extract any useful information from it. Not just to have very low uh, block error rate, but to extract just some useful information. We don't know how to do that. So that's, that's a challenge that we still we haven't been able to solve. Now also, uh, one of the fundamental um, uh, ideas in, in Shannon is the idea that you can separate the tasks of compression and transmission without loss of optimality. So in order to transmit some source of information through a noisy channel, you can divide the problem into two. One guy, an expert in data compression, generates an algorithm to do the removal of the redundancy. And then another guy, who is an expert in channel coding, will uh, will introduce redundancy to combat the, the errors introduced by the channel. Now, of course, you could say, why, why do we need to remove the redundancy and add redundancy? This sounds like, uh, sounds like uh, a waste of time. Well, what happens is that, of course, the redundancy that is inherent in the source may not be the redundancy that is tailored to combat the channel errors. Okay? So Shannon says, you know, you do this separately, and you don't lose anything. Well, you don't lose anything asymptotically, and you don't lose anything in the single user setting. 
in the multi-user setting, you do lose something. So in the multi-user setting, when you have uh, compression of sources at, di at different places or when you have transmission through uh, multiple access channel, then uh, these bits that are, are a universal currency in the single user case, they are no longer a universal currency in the multi-user case. Okay, now let's look at uh, the open problems in lossless data compression. Um, well, first of all, this idea that uh, you don't lose anything by separating compression and transmission is true, but with a caveat then it's true asymptotically as the block, block length goes to infinity. But when the block length is small, you may actually be able to gain by doing these things simultaneously. For example, in, uh, in third generation high speed uh, uh, wireless data, they don't do any data compression. So they are very good at uh, using the latest technology in error correcting codes to combat the channel noise. But these HTML pages that they send uh, through, the, through the wireless medium, they are sent uncompressed. Now you may say, how come they, they lose so much efficiency by doing this? Well, the problem is that the, the algorithms we know for example, the lempel sieve algorithm we know for universal data compression is very sensitive to errors. So, you know, when you use it for very long block lengths and so on, then it becomes very efficient. And indeed, in, in modems, this is used all the time. But when the block lengths are small, then people uh, try not to do this. Professor Spankowski actually has worked on uh, data uh, compression algorithms that are, that are tolerant of errors. But this is an area of growth. Where, where there are quite a few efforts in trying to come up with alternatives to the usual thinking of data compression so that it's, uh, much, more, it's much easier to couple with error correcting codes. Two dimensional sources, um, you know, for example, GIF is a standard uh, format for compressed images uh, that uses Lempel ZIF. But the feeling, the, the feeling is that we could still, uh, we should be able to do better than um, better compression ratios uh, for those, for those two-dimensional sources. So the, the area of uh, lossless data compression of images is still not fully, uh, not fully understood. So in the one-dimensional case, uh, the feeling is that we, we are much more advanced and we are able to get much better efficiency. Okay, now th there are these two names here, Slepian and Wolf, um, which will mean nothing to most of you. That this was a very uh, surprising result that was, uh, was obtained in the 1970s. And perhaps I would say is the most sur surprising result after Shannon's 19 1948 paper. But it's a result that has had absolutely no impact in the, in the practical world. So the idea here is that, um, you are compressing uh, a source of information, and the decoder not only gets the compressed version of this source of information, but gets some other source of information which is correlated with the original source of information. So the decoder has two ways in which it can tell what this original source of information is. But the encoder does not have access to that side information that the decoder has. And yet, the result says that the efficiency with which, with which you can do this is essentially the same as if the encoder had access to this side information that is present at the decoder. So essentially then the fundamental limit is no longer the entropy of the message, but the conditional entropy of the message given that side information, which can be considerably less. So one, one application would be back up, backing up a hard disk. So of course a hard disk has a, a huge amount of information, but when you back it up, it's only a, a few bits, it's only a, a tiny percentage of the disk that you are changing. So uh, the side information in that particular example is the previous the, the previous incarnation of the contents of the, hard, of, the, of the hard disk and the new information you want to encode is the new version. So, you know, can we back 
back up a hard disk with a dial-up modem with a very narrow bandwidth uh, channel. So this would be an application of Slepi and Wolf. We, the theory is there, but still we don't know how to build algorithms that will approach those limits. Well, video, what happens with video is that um, there we have the element of distortion, okay? Because then we, we uh, must allow distortion in that case, because of course analog signals have an infinite amount of information. Then the problem actually becomes one that is called Weiner's if, different pair of people. Um, and again, that's a problem that is receiving a lot of attention, how to uh, uh, achieve those fundamental limits. Now here I also have this bullet artificial intelligence, uh, and this is of course very much, very much in, uh, in computer science. Um, the idea is that these universal uh, compression algorithms are universal in the sense that they do not know, to, they, did not, they did, do not need to know anything about the source that they are going to compress. So you give gzip a file, you don't need to, to tell gzip, you know, this is an HTML file, this is a tech file, anything. It will do its job, it will compress it the best is it can by just looking at that file. But you can imagine that Google wants to uh, compress an HTML file, but of course Google has an, has, uh, an astronomical amount of HTML pages that they have seen. So they already have a very good uh, idea of what an HTML page looks like. So they could incorporate all this knowledge into an algorithm that would do a very good job at compressing HTML pages. So the challenge here is how do you incorporate all that knowledge in an efficient way? Okay. So, so we, could, we could indeed, in principle, do better than the algorithms that, that are used uh, in practice, if we were able to kind of like incorporate this artificial intelligence uh, that we have by, by knowledge of, of uh, previous knowledge of sources like that. And then here, just, uh, just for fun, and the last, uh, the last bullet here, is just to show you that even things that look like homework problems that you could assign in an in information theory course uh, not even the professor would know how to solve them. So here's, a, here's one. So you have a Markov chain. Uh, you have a zero or a one, and uh, with probability p, the next symbol is going to be uh, the same or different. So this was a case where Shannon already told us what the entropy of these source is. But if you observe that source through contaminated, through a binary symmetric channel, then this source only has two parameters, p and delta. And we don't know a formula for the entropy of this source as a function of p and delta, believe it or not. Okay, so it's very easy to come up with uh, with very simple problems that still we are in the dark. Lossy data compression, uh, which is the third main uh, main leg in the in, in Shannon's theory. The gap here between theory and practice is much bigger than in uh, channel uh, coding or in lossless data compression, much bigger. So for example, if you open an iPod, you're not going to see much information theory inside. Okay, so the, the, the compression algorithms that are used uh, in, uh, in MPEG and so on are very clever algorithms, but they are not really uh, uh, following a lot of the principles of, of Shannon theory. So why do you think that is? Well. Uh, Shannon's theory um, tells us um, what is the fundamental trade-off between a given distortion measure and the rate at which you can encode these sources, what's called the rate distortion function. Now the problem is that for the human ear or the human eye, we still don't really understand what, what are the right distortion measures. Okay, certainly we know that signal-to-noise ratio doesn't seem to be a very good performance measure. So things that have, that have higher reproductions, that have higher noise, low, lower signal-to-noise ratio, sometimes look better than, uh, or, or uh, sound better than, the, than reproductions that have better signal-to-noise ratio. So that's one hurdle. But it's not the only hurdle by any chance. You know, 
the counterpart of the universal lossless data compression problem, which, as I said before, is one of the great success stories in information theory. That's still open. I give you a, a given distortion function. I don't tell you anything about the statistics of the source. And then I want an algorithm that asymptotically will approach the fundamental limits. That's still unknown. But even if we you know, forget about doing this with sources that have complicated statistics or complicated uh, distortion functions, even for memoryless sources and very simple uh, distortion measures, still this constructive theory is at its infancy. So nowadays, there is a lot of work in, uh, in coming up with uh, lossy data compressors based on sparse graph codes. And the hope is that what we have been able to achieve in the data compression problem will also be able to achieve in the lossy data compression problem. So that will be like the first step in the road to reality, to be able to say something that, that is much more um, connected to practice. Multi-source fundamental limits. This is uh, something that I'm going to motivate with a compact disk type of compact disk that uh, Deutsche Grammophon uh, has, has marketed. So you see that here they have four Ds. So you know that the last D means that it's a compact disk. The second D means that the, the master is digital. And the third D means that it was recorded digitally. Now, what is the four D of Deutsche Grammophon? So they realize that uh, in digital recordings, the main source of noise in digital recordings was the cable that goes from the microphone to the console. Usually, it's a long cable, and that picks up noise. And of course, when you compress the signal, you are compressing a signal that already has noise. So even if you have a very good analog to digital compressor, <laughs> you are already compressing something that has noise. So then they said, aha, let's put the, micro the, 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 the A to D, the analog to digital converter, at the microphone itself. And then the cable will affect a digital signal. And of course, that's much more robust because we can then uh, use digital communications and, and get rid of that noise. That's, that's a very good idea. But then we can even go one step further, which the compact disk does not. The compact disk uses an A to D uh, technology that actually dates back to the 1930s, PCM. Actually, it's interesting that Shannon when he got, uh, he was named fellow of the IEEE sometime in the 50s. He was named fellow of the IEEE for his contributions to under the understanding of PCM rather than for information theory. Okay. So it's like when Einstein got the Nobel Prize for uh, the photoelectric effect rather than for relativity. Anyway, I digress. Uh, so here, imagine that you ha we have these two analog to digital converters at the left and right microphone. Now here, there is a lot of correlation usually between the left and right signals. Because after all, you know, there is some difference, of course, but they are picking up essentially the same signals with, uh, with different uh, mixtures and so on. So how do we exploit that correlation at these analog digital converters? So this is like the Slepian wolf problem that I mentioned before, but in the lossy case. And this is something that we still don't know what the fundamental limits are. Okay. All right. And then here I have another bullet, which is kind of like the counterpart of the last bullet I had. I can give you a very simple homework problem that I don't know how to solve. OK? <laughs> and the simple uh, homework problem is just a binary Markov chain with a bit error rate distortion measure. So I can tell you what the distor rate distortion function is when the, when the distortion is small. When the distortion is large, I still don't know what that rate distortion function is. So you, we are very primitive in information theory. All right, so what is the gradient of information theory today? And this is, of course, completely um, subjective, what I have in this slide. And, uh, and of course, the gradient is non-monotonic with, with time. So some of these things uh, have gone up in time, they have gone down, and, and then they have become popular again. But in my view, uh, information theory is every time more and more constructive in the sense that 
it's not just a matter of finding fundamental limits, that every time is more coupled to algorithms and the interplay between algorithms and their analysis. It's more applied in the sense that it's every time is more driven by practical problems of, of interest. And particularly, the wireless revolution has had a tremendously beneficial impact in information theory. Because you know, a lot of these systems have be, been designed knowing what information theory uh, predicts that the improvement in performance can be. Universal methods uh, are every time more and more important. And of course, this is very much coupled with computer science and um, algorithms like uh, data compression, things like um, individual sequence analysis. This is something that, that again, uh, the mathematics becomes quite complex, but uh, these analytical tools are very important in order to be able to understand these algorithms very well. Now, combinatorics perhaps is having less of a, of a specific weight than it had at some point in information theory. Early in information theory, um, some of the big contributors were really combinatorialists. And perhaps that is uh, not as prominent uh, these days. Continuous time um, used to be very important, but now I would say that, um, that every time people tend to start more and more with discrete time models. Ergodic theory is very important in information theory because all these asymptotic results, uh, at the end of the day, not all, but m most of them, at the end of the day, use some kind of ergodic uh, reasoning, like the law of large numbers or the ergodic theorem. So information theory uses a lot of ergodic theory. Ergodic theory actually uses information theory. Some of the main open problems in ergodic theory were solved using entropy. But um, perhaps now there is less of, a, of an intercourse between information theory and ergodic theory. The theory of error exponents, the one that I showed you with Shannon's picture, it's been so frustrating over the years that we haven't been able to even find the, the error exponent of this uh, binary symmetric channel, let alone other channels. And also, designers in the real world are not so interested in this problem. They are not willing to sacrifice rate in order to go from uh, block error rate 10 to the minus 10 to 10 to the minus 30. Because, you know, when you, it's, it's relying too much on, on the accuracy of your model to be able to do predictions of error probability of, of that uh, kind. We still even have problems, actually, even when we are operating near capacity, to have block error rate that is small. So let alone that is exponentially vanishing. So I think this is an, an area that um, you know, perhaps is going uh, downhill now. But an area that I think is very, very important is the area of intersections. Intersections of information theory and other fields. So in the, in the last few slides, I'm going to show you some of these intersections. Networks, um, I, I've listed here two, uh, two problems. I could have listed uh, several others. Network coding, you may have heard about this. Uh, this started a few years ago with the work of Raymond Jung in Hong Kong. So the idea here is that of course, in the internet, we have a packet, uh, a store forward uh, kind of architecture. What, uh, what a node can do is receive uh, a message and then just send the message uh, in one of the outgoing links. But imagine an architecture what you, where you could actually do algebraic operations with your messages. So for example, here, what you see is that you, you have a bit, A and B are binary value. And in this node here, what you send out is the, the XOR of those two bits. So by doing this, then both this node and that node can recover A and B. Whereas if you had a store forward uh, architecture, you would need, you would need two, two time slots in order to be able to recover A and B at each of these nodes. So indeed, there is efficiency to be gained by having this capability of doing these uh, algebraic operations. So this is very much in the spirit of coding, of being able to do algebraic operations with bits 
in the spirit of linear coding, where you do linear operations with bits. So what you can achieve here by using these network codes is what is called the max, uh, max flow min cut fundamental limit, which is usually attributed to Ford and Fulkerson, for, for those of you who have taken combinatorial optimization. Turns out that Shannon, at the same time as Ford and Fulkerson, had come up with the same theorem. Okay, but it's usually attributed to, to the people in operations research. Now, scaling laws are another interesting success story. The idea here is that uh, unlike the cellular uh, architecture where you have base stations uh, and uh, the space is partitioned in cells, in uh, these ad hoc networks, you just have a bunch of nodes. And these nodes can communicate pairwise with each other. And they can also act as relays. So you could, you could envision a network that in order to tra transmit information from here to here, you would actually establish a path that uh, would enable to do, uh, you would enable to do that by establishing a path, or maybe multipaths. You could send your information through several paths. So all this is done in a radio environment where everybody listens to each other. So the state of multi-user information theory is such that the, f the open problems are such that even, remember when you, we had those paradigms of the broadcast channel, the relay channel, and so on, even those problems are open. So let alone something of a topology like this. So there's no hope at this point to be able to, sh to, to solve something like this. But we can settle for less. And what these scaling laws uh, are about is quantifying what is the growth in the amount of information that this network can carry as the number of nodes increases. So uh, one of the main results was that the increase in information would scale as the square root of the number of nodes. And that is true if the network is kind of like in a sparse mode, so it's growing but the, the, the nodes are sufficiently kind of far away from each other. If, if the nodes are, are more dense, then the scaling can actually be faster. Can the, the, the growth can actually be even linear with the number of nodes. OK, now signal processing. This has uh, been another very interesting uh, uh, success story in the last few years, the, the intersection between estimation theory and information theory. Here's a formula. This I, I put here. I realize that uh, many of you uh, haven't seen information theory before or signal processing. But just to give you an idea, this is a, um, a purely information theory quantity. It's called the mutual information. And this is the minimum mean square error, which is a, a very important uh, a, figure of merit in estimation theory. So they are actually related when you have a Gaussian channel. Regardless of what the input is, when you have a Gaussian channel, these uh, two measures are, are related. So this was, we, we found this formula with a graduate student of mine, Dong Ning Guo, uh, a few years ago. And uh, since then, we've been uh, applying it to a, to a variety of problems, both within signal processing, with a, uh, with, um, or with, uh, within information theory, we have been able to solve some long-standing uh, proofs that, that were much harder. And then we show that these problems are actually problems in estimation theory rather than in information theory. Uh, also, uh, in nonlinear filtering, we could pose a problem that is purely nonlinear filtering problem. Uh, and uh, we have here a, a result that couples here we have we have um, we have a signal which you observe embedded in noise and you, then you want to filter this signal now this is a, a filter version of that signal that gets rid of uh, of the noise as much as it can by looking at the past and this this version is by looking at the past and the future so what we were able to show is a formula that couples the MMSC that um, that you get by looking only at the past with the MMSC you, you get by looking at both the future and the past. So this is a formula that has nothing to do with information theory, but the only way we know how to prove it is using information theory. 
This is a formula that also um, couples um, estimation theory quantities, like you, you see here the conditional expectation, with uh, mutual information. And this is a formula that is due to Tao, this mathematician who got the Fields Medal this, uh, this summer, and also got the MacArthur uh, Fellowship uh, last week. So just to show you that some, some mathematicians are actually using information theory. He, he, used, it, uh, he used this in uh, some number in, uh, some problem in number theory having to do with the primes. Okay, now this is the denoising, uh, the denoising application. So I don't have much time but left, but just to show you uh, this text denoising, we have an algorithm which we call DUDE, discrete universal denoising, that uh, takes a, a text that has been corrupted. Of course, the algorithm is colorblind, so it doesn't know where the errors are, but uh, can do a, a very good uh, job of uh, removing errors by just looking at the text and knowing nothing about the language. Okay, so as you can see from here, we go from 21 errors in this particular paragraph to seven errors. This is, this is not just knowing this paragraph. This is mm, inputting in the algorithm the whole Don Quixote, the whole novel, and uh, I'm just excerpting a given paragraph. So this is a, a field that is quite connected to data compression and universal modeling and all that. Now here, I think I'm going to skip this because I think we have we are a little bit short of time. So let me just uh, mention a couple more. Uh, oh, this this area of finite alphabet signal processing. This is also uh, a very interesting story because nowadays in signal processing. Every time you see this philosophy more and more, that the way to attack the problem, uh, a, a given problem, is not by trying to come up with an optimum, uh, an optimum processor. What you do is you, you divide and conquer. So you're going to have a module that may take care of denoising, another module that may take care of decoding, another module that may take care of decompression, and so on. So of course, this is a suboptimal approach. But you combat the inherent suboptimality in this approach by having a dialogue between these modules. And the currency that you interchange between these modules are the likelihoods of the digital data, the digital signal, the, the probability, your beliefs about these probabilities given what you've seen. Okay, so this is what is called the turbo principle. And this is started with these turbo codes that were invented in the 1990s, where these two modules were actually two decoders of two different convolutional codes. And each had a different belief for the probabilities of the transmitted data. And by interchanging this information, they were able to come up not with an optimum uh, decision, but with a very good decision. Okay, So this is an extremely powerful approach. And so here, the universal currency, as I was saying, is this, uh, are these likelihoods that turn out to be uh, very connected with, with work in information theory. So control, actually, uh, lately, there are also some applications to control. And some of these feedback communication schemes uh, are control-oriented in the sense that what they aim to is they encode all the information in the initial state of a dynamical system. And then after that, what you try is to explain the noise that has been added to that initial uh, condition. Or sometimes uh, you may have a noisy channel between the plant and the controller, so then you have to re-examine the whole uh, problem of control design under that, that uh, uh, under that condition, assuming that you can actually encode and decode information. So it's a mixed problem between control and communication, digital communication. Computer science. Now here, I could, you know, you could even teach a, co a, a, a whole course on intersections between computer science and, and uh, information theory. I've only listed two here. 
One is analytic information theory, and Purdue is the leading exponent with Professor Spankowski in this area. The idea here is to analyze algorithms using analytic methods from complex analysis that uh, um, deal with uh, transforms, for example. And these methods have been very successful in the analysis. For example, NUTH have used them a lot in order to analyze algorithms. When uh, they are applied to information theory problems, like data compression problems, uh, these, these methods succeed where many other methods have failed. Other combinatorial methods and so on have failed where these methods actually uh, succeed in getting very good uh, bounds and uh, very good estimates about the fundamental limits. Interactive communication is another uh, very interesting area at the interface between computer science and information theory. Essentially there, um, there are several agents and they have, say, a common, uh, a common goal and they are going to cooperate in order to achieve this common goal, which may be the computation of a function. Uh, but each of these agents only knows uh, a subset of, say, the arguments of this function. So what you want to do is minimize the traffic, the minimum number of messages that they have to interchange in order to compute this function. So again, this is a, a, a kind of like a combinatorial problem. And, uh, and a lot has been done in the, in the last uh, 20 years or so. And there are many other uh, problems at the boundary of computer science and, and, uh, and the information theory, going to the work of Kolmogorov with algorithmic complexity and uh, the complexity of Boolean functions and so on. But I won't say more, more about that. Now, other intersections that perhaps go outside uh, the areas of computer science, electrical engineering, and so on, of information theory. Now, one, one thing is that from the very beginning, information theory had, was, was mm, very popular outside its natural habitat. So its natural habitat is really compression and transmission. But people try to apply it from the very beginning to everything, from linguistics to um, biology to you name it. If you Google uh, creationism and information theory, you're going to find quite a big, quite a few hits. Um, so uh, there have been some success stories. Uh, for example, in economics now, there is this theory of rational inattention. And uh, this theory of rational inattention has been able to explain some experimental data by solving some uh, equations that come from assuming that the uh, economic actors receive the information from, from the world through a channel that has limited channel capacity. And that's why sometimes uh, these economic actors do not necessarily process uh, the data in the optimal way. Because there is some delay, there is some noise with which they get this data, or they, there is uh, a narrow pipe with which they get this data. Quantum information theory. Um, in this series, there's going to be a talk by Schumacher on quantum information theory in, uh, I don't know when, uh, in, a yeah, in November. So you'll see there, this is an interesting uh, area also, because uh, the main theorems of Shannon, as, as far as com uh, compression and, um, and transmission, you can actually post them in a quantum uh, in a quantum setting and uh, come up with counterparts to this theorem there. Uh, bio, um, bioengineering, uh, biological uh, systems in general, information theory also has been applied uh, to, uh, you know, you name it, bioinformatics, the analysis of DNA data, uh, the analysis of uh, neural systems, how information gets transmitted in neurons and so on. That has been, uh, that has given rise to many, many papers. Physics, uh, Wheeler, um, a few years ago, a Nobel Prize uh, we, uh, winning uh, physicist. He didn't, get the Nobel he didn't get the Nobel Prize? Okay, sorry. So, but some of his students got it, right? Yeah. <laughs> Feynman, for example. So, um, so he had this, uh, this program of it from bit. 
So the idea is to explain a physical reality with information. The idea that ultimately everything is information. Okay. So um, uh, bullshit, of course, is uh, <laughs> there's a lot of bullshit in this in, in this interaction between physics and information theory. <laughs> so I say I say bullshit from it from bit. <laughs> uh, now. There, is, uh, there, are, uh, there are quite a few works that, uh, in physics that you can see that every time, more and more, the arguments are, are, are information-oriented. They have to do with information. Now, the problem is that many times the, the rigor in the, argument, in the arguments is not the rigor that we are, we are used to in information theory. So they are more of a, of a suggested, suggestive level rather than mathematical level. All right. So uh, I think the, the last thing I, I wanted to mention is that there are some emerging tools that information theorists are actually using uh, increasingly. These tools are not new, but they are, their application in information theories is uh, more recent. Optimization tools are very important because Shannon the Shannon uh, theorems um, actually put the fundamental limits as the solutions of some optimization problems. They don't actually.